worship on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. A few announcements at the beginning um, as we are now having worship services on Sunday mornings only um, at 9 o'clock in German, 11 o'clock in English, which also means then that we are taping the service for um, our online channel uh, during the 11 o'clock service. And uh, it's a little bit of an inconvenience. Um, I ask you to be forgiving about it uh, since uh, it will be posted then later during the day and, um, and uh, you don't find it uh, the previous evening, for example, any longer. Uh, that comes with the change of uh, our taping schedule. So again, asking for um, uh, your understanding that we have made these changes. Next Sunday, uh, September 13th, uh, we will be having our anniversary uh, worship service. 90 years of St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, in Winnipeg. Um, unfortunately, we had to make some changes uh, in our uh, festivities. Uh, we can't do what we wanted to do. Uh, we will still have our worship services, and for those who are coming, and also for those uh, who um, needed to stay at home, that there will be a small item that we can hand out as a keepsake. Though that is, at least for now, uh, a little bit of, uh, of an element that will allow us to make that connection, to celebrate, and uh, as we look forward to, a uncertain and unknown time when we will be able to uh, come together as a congregation and then celebrate more properly. Um, again, to remind you to continue to be careful and, uh, and watchful uh, in terms of um, protecting yourselves and uh, others, uh, and hopefully that the uh, virus and the numbers of those who get infected will go down and that it will also mean then have a positive um, result on, on all of us as we are uh, going about our public and our private lives. Again, welcome to worship. Um, with these announcements, let us now move to our opening hymn, Come, You Thankful People, Come.
We have gathered for worship on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come before God to confess our sins. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and God forgives us all our sins. As a called and minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Psalm 32. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, always lead and follow us with your grace, that we may be still more intent on doing good. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As for the epistle lesson, we uh, hear the uh, passage from Romans chapter 13, where Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to, conduct, uh, to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is a fulfilling of the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 18th chapter. 
Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptation to sin, for it is necessary that temptation come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As for our next hymn, we hear, Stand Up. Stand up for Jesus.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. We know this saying from Jesus, and not just because we heard it a few moments ago as part of the gospel lesson. It is uh, one of the better known, well-known verses in the New Testament. This verse tends, tends to come to our mind when there are only a few people who come together for devotions or worship. We quote this passage to indicate that this is indeed a rightful gathering of Christ's followers if there is maybe only a handful of people who have come together. This word from Jesus describes very aptly our current worship experience. With the outbreak of the pandemic, we had to change the forward format of our in-person worship services, only allowing a few people at the beginning, only two or three, literally, who were allowed to come to worship. It is as if Jesus had known that a time would come, and not only because of persecution, when we as his followers would face severe obstacles to gather, to be gathered for worship. It seems that Jesus gives us with this verse a few directives about what constitutes the minimal requirements for worship. It appears in this light, it appears in this light if we look at this verse without looking at the larger context. We get a different picture if we look at the broader context and here I would like primarily to look at the second half of the gospel lesson um, and not so much at the first half where we uh, heard about uh, the treatment of the little ones in our midst. Uh, but here, the second half, uh, do you remember, do you uh, recall what this passage was about? Jesus, in this part, addressed the matters of fraternal, of congregational correction. Or with a different term, we could say that Jesus was talking about church discipline. In this chapter, Jesus gives us some advice on how we should deal with members in the church who sin against you, who have caused some tensions, even strife. Jesus' suggestions sound good. They sound right. As a first step, talk to that person alone in an attempt to straighten out things, to rectify things. If this does not work, Talk to him in the presence of witnesses, and after that, bring it to the attention of the entire community. And if this does not help, he declares, or it seems that he declares that, well, he declares that you should, that this person should be to you like a Gentile or a tax collector. Without saying it explicitly, it seems that Jesus suggests to expel this person because he is no longer a part of this faith community. Usually, we have a difficult time in the church dealing with conflict. Quite often, we are in denial. We may have that idea that there ought not to be frictions, tensions, conflicts in Christ's church. We pretend that they do not happen in the community of saints, but in reality, not everything happens in a harmonious way even in the church. And this is because we are not just saints, but because we are also sinners. I think that each one of us can see himself, can see herself, in the lost sheep that we hear about in the gospel text. It is not just that others who go astray, this can happen to me as well. I also can go astray. Everybody can go astray because this is the case. It is comforting to know that the, God, that the Good Shepherd goes to look after us, to bring us back to the other sheep, to the flock. This reveals something important about Jesus. For him, each individual, each individual in the community of faith is precious, matters. He notices it when somebody is missing. And let it be just one person, let it be just one sheep. He goes after this person, 
the context, he goes after the sheep, and when he found it, when he found the person, him or her, he rejoices and brings him back to be reunited with the flock, to be reunited with the community. In the end, it is also about being able to be a part of the same community, to graze on the same pasture without being expelled. I do not know how sheep deal with differing opinions or when they have conflict, but as human beings, we should be able to deal with differences without bleating at each other. Jesus tells us, that God is going a long way to find us in order to gather us around him. In contrast, as people, even God's people, we do not always act in ways that are in sync with God's will, with what God is doing. It can and it does happen that we expel, excommunicate a person from our midst. Was this not what Jesus had on his mind when he came up with his conflict management plan? It appears that this was Jesus' approach, that we should exclude the troublemaker if there is no other solution left. But I think there is another option here. I think the text could also be understood in another way, that we should try everything to avoid expulsion. But let's listen to the text. There is this phrase, and I admit it puzzles me a little bit. It actually puzzles me quite a bit. The person who is expelled should be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. That is, it sounds like it, this is a despised person, an outcast, a person who does not belong to you. But is this really what Jesus means here? What does he want to tell us here? even though, you know, when we consider how Jesus has treated over and over again Gentiles and tax collectors. I am thinking of the Canaanite woman. Jesus praised her for her great faith. Even though Jesus rejected her initially, she remained persistent. She even assumed that God's heart must be bigger, that God's mercy must reach beyond the children of Israel in the form of the crumbs, you remember the text, in the form of the crumbs that fall from the master's table that can be devoured, savored by those dogs, by those pagan dogs under the table, so that the crumbs, that the food is not just there for the children of Israel, but there is something that is also left for those pagan dogs beyond and outside the community of Israel who also benefit from what is on the table. And let me refresh your memory how Jesus embraced Zacchaeus, a tax collector. He told him, Today, today salvation has come to this house, to Zacchaeus' house, since he also is a son of Abraham. It is quite clear Jesus cared for the Gentiles and the tax collectors. And as I ponder Jesus' suggestions, does he really give us step-by-step instructions for what needs to be done before one is to be excluded from the community of saints? Are they really meant as a how-to manual? I doubt that this was the intended goal. After all, did he not talk before those steps about the lost sheep that was found? I am not so sure that the text is necessarily about exclusion, about excommunication. God made an effort to find the lost sheep. Why would we then, as a human community, want to rid it from our community, from our church community? Do Jesus' words possibly aim at something else? This is what I like to believe. I think that Jesus' expression, such a person should be to you a Gentile and a tax collector, is not necessarily geared toward expulsion. I think that we can hear his words as an incentive, just as Jesus himself has set an example for us that we as well should go after the hopelessly outcast and embrace them as if Jesus told us, 
Give it another try. Don't give up on them. Here comes into play what Jesus has got to say about binding and losing. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed on heaven. Binding and losing, these two words have a double meaning each. When we hear binding, it sounds positive at first. When people are bound together, they are connected and form a strong bond of unity. But a person can also be bound in that sense that one's wrists or ankles are bound with a rope. And then I am bound in a way that I cannot move freely any longer. I am, I am constrained. It is similar with losing. First off, there is a negative notion. When I lose ties with another person, I want to be disconnected from this person so that there isn't anything left that ties me to that person. On the other hand, it also contains a positive message. When I manage to lose a knot, I get untangled. It may give me the momentum that I need to have a new, open approach to a problem that has kept me captive. This may free me to work out new ties. Let's hear it again when Jesus said, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Or, in other words, the chains. The chains of sin that kept our mind bound on human things will get in the way of our relationship with God. We need the loosing from that ballast to be freed, to experience salvation as a gift of grace from God. I have always looked at Jesus as someone who tells us how we should live in a fulfilling relationship with God and with one another. To think that Jesus could suggest that we should find ways to dissolve these relationships and thus actually destroy life in community is contrary to what he stands for. For Jesus, it is important that we find ways to connect these ties of communal living. Just as he pointed out by saying, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is immediately followed by his famous phrase, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. When we are able to form a strong bond with one another here on earth, God will also give us the means to resolve our conflicts. It appears to me that Jesus' command to bind and to lose is meant as an encouragement to form and create a God-intended unity with one another, which will naturally have an impact on our worship. In worship, we come together as those who seek to have these earthly chains loosed so that God can bind us together with unbreakable cords so that we may be fashioned into a community of faith that hath its strength and its resolve in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is Holy God, we praise your name.
Living together in trust and hope, let us profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this morning's second reading from Romans, the Apostle Paul speaks about the importance of love. He boldly proclaims that we should owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another hath fulfilled the law. The traditional view sees in love the willingness to do good for the sake of the other person, this means that we ought not to look towards our own needs, but to the needs of our neighbor. Stewardship, grounded in Christian love, seeks to make use of our gifts to serve our neighbor. Works of charity should follow. As the ancient church father Gregory the Great pointed out that the proof of love is in the works. Where love exists, it works great things, but when it ceases to act, it ceases to exist. As you seek to follow Jesus, I want to commend you for your own initiatives, striving to practice this kind of charitable love. And I also want to thank you for your faithful and ongoing support so that we here at St. Peter's can continue to practice charitable love in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers. Make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of this earth so that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in the midst of them. Hear the prayers of your people and grant our supplications. O Lord, grant to your people courage that with boldness we may speak your name in witness and warn sinners so that they may come to faith and repentance and though enjoy the forgiveness of their sins. Give your church wisdom and strength by your spirit, that ye may be steadfast and unmovable in your word and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, be present among your people to serve us with the gift of your grace and grant that we may receive them with joy. Give your church faithful pastors and workers who minister in your name and strengthen the faith of life together of your baptized people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, give us good and honest leaders who will govern according to your word and will. Give us grace that we may not fail to pray for those who will lead us and to act as good citizens and good neighbors to one another. Give us peace to the nations and bring an end to violence, prejudice, and racism. Guide us to know and respect all life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you send rain upon the earth and turn the seeds into plants, rich with fruit for harvest. Accept our thanks and praise for the continued goodness in providing a good harvest and food for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you urge us to give special care and guidance to the young and those new to the faith. Give us grace that we may not lead them into temptation or sin but guard their faith by making known to them the full counsel of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
O Lord, you are the strength of the weak, the healing of the sick, the comfort of those who grieve, and the peace of those near death. In silence we name before you, whom we entrust into your special care. May they be sustained in their afflictions, comforted in life and death, and delivered to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, deliver us from pandemic and pestilence, from disaster and danger, and from a sudden death that kept in faith, we may be preserved through this mortal life and in death be received into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, O Lord, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Bind Us Together. Go in peace, serve the Lord.